5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that our fathers would trust you with their with their whole heart. We pray that they would lean on you, not their own understanding. May they acknowledge you so that so you can make their path straight. Amen. I I heard an old story how Satan came from glory how he gave life for Calvary to save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning and his precious blood atoning and his I repented of my Happy Father's Day. Um, it is a day where, you know, we, we remember our, our dads and, and some, sometimes uh, they, yeah, that's right. Now, sometimes they are good memories. Sometimes you feel a loss there if your dad has already passed away. But man's right. You always remember them and you love them. Um, and, uh, and if you, there's forgiveness that needs to be given, even after they go, then forgive them. And uh, so that you can live your life uh, in the light of Christ. But a while ago, uh, Brett was talking to my sister Nelda here, who was visiting, and uh, she she likes to tell us in what order everybody's born. And I'm I'm number six, by the way. She's she's number one. And uh, but Brett said, "Well, it, you come to see your brother, right?" And she said, "Yeah." And he, and he said, "Is is he okay? Is is he is he a good one?" And she went, "Well." He's number six, <laughs> whatever that means. I am so glad to have my sister Nelda with me, and uh, she'll be with us for the next couple of weeks. And I tell you, it, it is such a, um, she'll tell you too if you talk to her that she was born two days after Christmas, and she was our Christmas present. And today she is my Father's Day present. Um, we went and got her yesterday from uh, uh, Nashville so that my sister and her husband could, could go on vacation. But it is Father's Day. We're going to talk about a father's love today. And, you know, oftentimes the memories that we have of our dads are great. Others times, you know, I, I remember sometimes when my dad, he'd fuss at me and grap at me. And, and those, you know, I'm like, ah, oh, boy, those, those, you know, all of it's a learning time. But there is a father that is perfect in every way. And that is the father we're going to talk about today. And, and dads, maybe we can glean some things off of this heavenly father that we're going to talk about and some of his attributes that we could grab onto, that we could uh, put into play into our families as we minister. I don't know. Hey, did y'all have a chance to read this or not yet? I, I was reading this a while ago. Listen to this. Seek ye first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Alleluia. Alleluia. Lord, we lift up all our fathers unto you. Give each your wisdom and teach them to lead their families in your ways. And that's what today is. Today is just an encouragement to lead our families in the way of the Lord because his ways are perfect. And, and at some point, we as dads, I'll say especially as leaders, the spiritual leader of the family, we got, we got to grab hold of this and remember that God's ways are perfect, not ours, and we need to truly follow Him from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed to honor God our Father. We're going to be over in Psalm 103, and we, we do not have it on the screen today, so we actually have to use our Bibles. I know. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 103, and we're going to be reading beginning in verse 8. And while you're turning there, uh, I want to tell you a little story. Back in the 80s, y'all might remember this, uh, there was a craze all over the nation about, you know, it, people love their dogs, people love their cats, but there was a craze in the 80s about people getting pot-bellied pigs. Do y'all remember that? that how many of y'all had one? No way. We actually have one that had a pot. That's awesome. Well, one of the things that they promoted with the pot-bellied pigs is they promoted that they were kind, sweet, smart. They only got up to about 40 pounds. Well, what happened was, um, and, and that, some of them were just like that, but a lot of them grew to be about 140 pounds and were aggressive and uh, began to eat up the furniture and the walls and these kind of things. Not, uh, your dogs do the same things. But the pot-bellied pigs, they began to get kind of a poor reputation. Well, this guy, his name is Dale Riffle. And Dale actually had one of these pot-bellied pigs, and it grew larger than what was expected, and it began to eat his house. And he actually moved from the city out to a farm area, to where his, and he did this because of his pot-bellied pig. And he didn't, he, he wanted to keep it in a nice area, and he still wanted to take care of it and loved his pot-bellied pig. But what ended up happening is he began hearing all over the nation that there were others that did not want their pot-bellied pig anymore. So he began to put it out there that if you want to bring your pot-bellied pig to my farm, you're welcome to do that. And... Uh, he actually had 180 people bring them, uh, bring him their pot-bellied pigs out on this farm. Now, now get this: out on this particular farm. Now, these are ones that they didn't they didn't learn how to use a litter box, which some of them do. They, these were ones that were eating the walls and the floors and the. I mean, it was just a mess. Well, anyway, they brought him out to his farm, and this is what his farm offered. Uh, swimming pools for the pigs. They would listen to classical music. Uh, they, Dale would take the time to give each one of the pot-bellied pigs a belly rub. I don't know if y'all do this to your pets or not, but, but Dale just went all out. Now get this. They never feared, the whole time they were there, they never feared going to a barbecue, uh, being put away, being killed, anything like that. They knew they were in a safe place. Here's what he told one of the reporters. He said, I think we're all put on earth for some reason, and I guess pigs are my lot in life. How could anybody in his right mind fall so totally in love with pigs? You know, you got to think about this. We have a God in heaven that loves a rebellious, sinful uh, very indifferent people who, I mean, who actually in the scriptures, we're called his enemies until we come to Christ. And so God loves us. Uh, God has given us his son. He died on the cross for our sins. Uh, you know, I know that his lot in life may have been pigs, but God's lot in life was to love and save a people that did not love him, a people that, that 
shunned him, rebelled against him, but God continued to love uh, and bless us and, and give us the life that, that we have now in his son, uh, Jesus Christ. So I want us through this lesson today to get a picture of who God is, a true picture of who he is. God is one who has a long fuse. You know, a lot of us have a short fuse. If somebody says, hey, so-and-so's got a short fuse, you know exactly what they meant. God has a long fuse. He has a short memory, he's full of grace, and he's got a big heart. Those are the four things we're going to talk about this morning. And guys, if we as men uh, can glean some of these things to put in place in our families, these attributes of God, I think it would do our families good to see the man of the family uh, step up and put these attributes into place. The very first one I want to talk about is this. God has a long fuse. In Psalm 103, beginning in verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. I want us to just listen to that for a minute because what David is quoting is actually uh, out of Exodus 34, verse 6, and it says, The Lord passed before him uh, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and in truth. This was written uh, about 500 years uh, after uh, the time of Moses, this, this one in Psalms. But Moses, 500 years earlier, had written this at the time when the Hebrews, uh, they had come out of Egypt, they had seen God's hand in so many ways, and now Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And we know what happened there. While Moses was up on the mountain, they began to get restless down below and ended up uh, making a golden calf. And when Moses came down off the mountain, he became very angry and he saw what the people were doing. And, and they, the people even cried out, this is the God, looking at the, the golden calf, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And they were worshiping and just being immoral all over the place. Well, anyway, this is the, this is the light of the psalm that David is quoting because God had he even told Moses, he said, Moses, I need you to back up because I'm fixing to nuke these people. I'm about to wipe them off the face of the earth. And Moses pleaded, and he said, God, please. He said, what would the people say about a God who, who brought us out of Egypt and did so many wonderful and great things? And it says that God relented and had mercy on the people. This is a God who has patience who loves his people, uh, you know, just as 103 verse 13, if you go down just a little bit further, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. You know, you look at the prodigal son who uh, had run away from home and squandered all of the wealth that his father had given him, but the father at the end of the story has compassion on his son. This is all a picture of God, who He really is, the heart of God. When, when we look at a situation and we go, man, I'm not giving them compassion. They don't deserve compassion. You're absolutely right. We don't deserve compassion. We're going to talk about that in a minute. If God were to actually give us what we deserve, we'd be in trouble. But God loves us and has compassion on us, and He's patient with us. Um, when we were down in Florida, me and Linda, we had stopped at Eckerd's to get something. I don't remember what it was, but we were pulling out of Eckerd's, and there was a little bit of a traffic jam. Uh, a woman was just trying to cross the street, but this guy behind her was honking and honking, and they were yelling at each other. Then she got out of the car uh, and started fussing at him. And it was just, I mean, the impatience was just incredible. It reminds me of, you know, I, you've had your car stall, I'm sure, somewhere at a red light. Um, I've had mine, but there's this, this guy, he, he had his car stalled at a red light, and behind him people started honking, and the guy behind him was honking. And so he, he got out of his car, and he walked back to the guy behind him, and he said, hey, man, look. He said, 
I am so sorry, I'm trying to start my car. He said, but if you would go and try to start my car for me and let me go ahead and honk your horn for you. People get so impatient, but God is a patient God. He, matter of fact, I, I love patient and compassionate. In Matthew 9, 36, he says, he saw the crowds. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Lamentations 3, 22 and 3, 23 says this, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. Uh, we need to be a patient people, compassionate, ready to, to just pour out the, the grace and the mercies instead of getting uh, uptight, upset. You know, I, I think about times when... Uh, uh, my dad would, I'd be helping him in the garage and he'd say, Harry, I need you to go get me that wrench over there. And, and it, he said, get me that left-handed screwdriver. Y'all know, there's no left-handed screwdriver. I would be over there looking at my dad just be over there giggling. <laughs> I'd be getting frustrated and I'd say, dad, I, here's this one. I don't, he said, Harry, that's fine. He said, there's no left-handed screwdriver. And I'd be like, oh, dad, um, the patience that he had with me sometimes was short, sometimes was long. But dads, it goes a long way to be patient with your kids, to love them, even when they keep asking you the same question a thousand times. Answer the question a thousand times. Love your kids and continue to go. Second thing is this. God chooses to have a short memory our memories are getting short shorter as we go um, it just happens with age but God he has chosen to have a short memory we don't choose it sometimes we just forget things God doesn't do that um, you, do y'all remember those uh, uh, magic slates is what they called them it was uh, a toy that you got for about a buck it had a little pencil with it but you would write on it, and it was a carbon paper, and once you wrote what you wanted to write, you could just rip it up and put it back down, and it would all disappear. Whatever you wrote on there, it would just disappear, and you could start all over. I believe that that is what our life is. God has given us, um, you know, he said that the mercies are new every morning. Every day we have opportunity to have a new slate a new beginning but God chooses to to forget some of the things that we do actually our sin when we come to him we confess it he forgives us not to be remembered anymore think about that for a minute God does not keep record of wrong how many times do we as parents we tend to bring something up from our kids you know hey can I borrow the keys to the car do you remember that before I give you these keys, do you remember the last time you took these keys, you, you got a ticket, you, you got a bumper, uh, you, you got a dent in the bumper, you know, all of these things, and we, we bring these things up. You were late coming home before I give you these keys, and we go through a list, and, and we go through other lists. As in our minds, we keep this list. God does not keep record of our wrongs. Man, how blessed is that? When, when we start bringing stuff up to him that we've done in the past, he is going, I'll be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm, I don't remember that. He chooses not to remember that. Listen to these verses. Um, in, one, when, in one Psalm 133, he says this, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, if you should keep record of our wrongs, O Lord, who could stand? No one. We'd all, we'd, we would all just be guilty, condemned, condemned to hell, separated from him if he were to keep record of our wrongs. But I want to read you uh, what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in who? Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. In Jeremiah 31, 34, God says this, 
I will remember your sins no more. God does not hold our sins against us. When we come to Him in confession and repentance, He does not hold our sins against us. Um, he is gracious to, to just choose to, not, to forget these. Can you imagine this? Imagine that if I were to go to God and say, God, look, I have yelled at my kids time and time again this week. I'm so sorry, uh, but God, I'm asking for your forgiveness. And I, I feel really bad about this. I've already gone to my kids, and I've, I've told them that, that I'm sorry and that I'm working on this. But God, I need your forgiveness, and please help me. Wouldn't it be something if God said, you did what and you did it again? Harry, you've done this a hundred times this week. And, and I only forgave you. I stopped at 50. I, I was, boy, I was counting. And there's only so much, Harry, that I can take. God don't work like that, does he? God, when you, when you sin and you come to him in confession, and repentance, he forgives. And he, unlike us, chooses to forget. I'm very thankful that, that when I sought his forgiveness, that he forgave me and didn't bring up all those past sins that I had done in the past. He, he, he doesn't harbor his anger toward me. He, he doesn't hold anything against me when I come to him uh, asking for his forgiveness. Um, so we, we see here that God is patient with us. He is forgiving. He has a short memory. The third thing is this. God gives us much grace. And he doesn't give us what we deserve. Uh, look at verse 10. He says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. If God punished us every time we deserved it, guess what? It would be relentless. We would be in trouble constantly, all the time. But the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. There was a young girl who... Uh, had been adopted by this family, and this young girl actually had some severe uh, behavioral problems. She was very unruly, always talking back to the parents, and didn't get along with the other kids. and, and it, it was a hard It was a hard time in her life. And the parents actually told her, said, "Look, if if you can't behave, then you're going to stay home while me, while us, and the." other children go to Walt Disney World and sure enough what happened was that that little girl had to stay back um, with a babysitter while the mom dad and the the blood children got to got to go to Walt Disney World and and it just broke this girl's heart well that adoptive situation only lasted two years uh, it, it dispersed it, it just dissolved well what ended up happening is this little eight-year-old girl now uh, was adopted by another family who had some children. And the behavioral problems continued. It, it was hard on the family. But he had heard that, um, oh, you know, what happened with the family and they're going to Walt Disney World. He thought, you know, he said, we can go to Walt Disney World. We can do it one day. And... When he told the family, guys, guess what? This summer we're going to Walt Disney World. Man, they were all excited. And even that little eight-year-old girl, man, her eyes lit up. And I would like to tell you that her behavioral problems got better. But they did not. They got worse. It was made it very difficult. She made it very difficult on the family. She was doing all, I mean, back talking, hitting the other kids. I mean, just doing things that just were unruly. But the dad and mom said, honey, uh, look, we need you 
to behave so that we can go on this trip without too much trouble. And the dad said that it was right on the tip of his tongue to tell that little girl, you know what? Unless you behave, you're not going. But he remembered what had happened before, and he said, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take her with us. So they all went to Walt Disney World, and she was troubled all the way there. When they got to Walt Disney World, she was troubled all in Walt Disney World. After the first day at Walt Disney World, and she was getting in trouble time and time again, um, they were sitting on their bed at night, and they were talking. She was exhausted. Um, they, had, they had had a busy day riding all the rides and things. But when they got together, the mom, dad, and her, she, she began to ask questions. And one of the things that they were talking about, she started talking about, um, was her family from the last time to this time. But this was a statement that she made. She very quietly, you know, they, they were sitting there quiet. But she said, Daddy, I finally got to go to Disney World, what I've always wanted to do. But it wasn't because I was good. It was because I am yours. There's a big difference. See, what we like to do is we like to to put everything on behavioral. If you're good, you're going to go to heaven. If you're bad, you're going to go to hell. But I'm going to tell you this. A lot of good people are going to go to hell. And there's going to be a lot of bad people who got saved even at the last minute of their life that we would go, oh, there's no way they got saved. But God's mercy and grace and forgiveness is all the way up to the last minute. And they're going to go on to heaven and be with him in glory. Think, look back at the thief on the cross. I mean, dying on the cross next to Jesus. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise because you put your faith in me. It's not about being good. God gives much grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. Um, it, it's an outrageous grace. It's a farmer Back over in Matthew, it talks about a farmer paying a full day's wage to a crew of guys that didn't really want to work real hard, but he paid the same wage for those who worked all day to those who only worked an hour. That's grace. It's the insanity of a shepherd who's, who's got a big flock of a hundred, but one of the sheep goes astray, and he leaves the whole flock to go after that one outrageous grace it's the love of a father who who hands over all of his inheritance to his sons and one of the sons goes off and just just wastes it on wild living but when the son comes back they have a party for him because the son was lost but now he's found outrageous grace this is god's heart for us he loves us his grace is real he's called us and we've answered we, we we desire everybody on this planet i do believe with all of my heart has an empty spot that needs to be filled with god the holy god jesus christ we in here we heard god's call and we answered and we experience that grace, that, that outrageous grace that he gives to us when we did not deserve it. And the greatest example of that is the grace that he gave us on the cross. <coughs> um, this morning, as we respond to God, I, I pray that we would respond uh, to God in a, in a way that would reflect it in our families, that we would be patient, that we would uh, be forgiving, that we would be compassionate, um, 
and, and pour this grace out on our families in a way that it's not dependent upon how they act toward us. Because if that's the case, then I'll be honest, there, we wouldn't like anybody. If it was always about, if you treat me right, I'll treat you right. That is not what God came with. He came with, you treated me with hatred and love, disrespect, but I love you anyway. And here it is. That's the kind of love that he's talking about here. When we go on down, uh, verse 11 and 12, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward us who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God has a big heart, and he has much forgiveness. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, they said, Harry, somebody's, somebody has said something and done something that is really hard right now. And I have to deal with it, and I have to, I have to show them grace, and, and uh, I need you to pray for me. And I said, man, I, I can do that. And then he said, the grace that God has given me, may I pour out that same grace on those that have offended me. And guys, that's the heart of God. That is God's spirit in us. Uh, the psalmist tells us that when we ask God to forgive us of our sins, that he removes them as far as the east is to the west. Y'all understand the significance of that. It's not north to south. Because if he says, man, I'll, I'll forgive your sins as far and forget them as far as the north is to the south. Well, if you start at the north and you go south, well, then you're going north again. Then you're going south again. If you're going east to west, you're always going east and you're always going west. There is not a circular mode. You're always going one direction instead of north and south, which means the forgiveness that he pours out when he says, so far has he removed our transgression from us as far as the east is from the west. When you confess your sins, when you come to him with a repentant heart, as far as the east is to the west, it's no more. It's, it's, it's gone. It's, it, it is in oblivion. It is that direction not to return. That's what he does with your sins and my sins. That's what Jesus did at the cross. He took our sins away to where we, we stand not in condemnation anymore, but in righteousness because of Christ Jesus. There's a lot of uh, metaphors in the scripture about uh, what God says he's going to do with our sin. Listen to this. In Micah 7.19, if you're writing these down, Micah 7.19, he says that he's going to throw our sin into the deepest part of the sea. In Isaiah 38.17, he says that he'll put behind his back, put our sin behind his back where he can't see it anymore. In Isaiah 43.25, he says that he will blot our sin out. In Isaiah 44, 22, he says he'll sweep it away like a morning mist that gets burned off by the sun. And in Jeremiah 31, 34, God says that he will refuse to remember our sin. So he just blocks it out of his memory. Corey Ten Boom, y'all remember her? She was the woman that uh, actually survived the Holocaust. Her family was uh, hiding Jews. Uh, and they were eventually caught, and all of her family ended up going to concentration camps. Uh, she was the only one out of her family that survived, and she spent most of her time after she survived traveling all over Germany and speaking about uh, God's greatness during that time and how God worked some miraculous things. Well, in 1947, while she was speaking at a church in Munich, she was speaking to a church, but in the congregation, 
she recognized one of the men who were the Nazi guards uh, in, in a concentration camp. It's called Ravensbrück. That's where she was. That's where this Nazi guard was. And he was the worst of the worst is how she describes him as far as uh, the guards. And he was in the congregation as she was teaching the people, testifying before the people about God's forgiveness. All right. I can't even imagine the horrors that took place there. But she was right there in the midst, and this guard was one of the worst, said that he did some terrible things uh, toward her and her sisters, uh, and it just, it was, it was horrific, and he was sitting right there, and she was teaching about God's forgiveness. So what do you do with that? Well, here, here's what happened. Um, after she spoke, a lot of people would come up and talk to her. And this gentleman came up and he said, you mentioned Ravenbrook in your message. He said, I, I loved your message. I love the message on forgiveness. But he said, I want you to know something. Uh, I think it's wonderful how God's forgiveness works and, and that he casts our sin into the bottom of the sea. He said, but I was at um ravensbrook he said i was there he said i was a guard there and i mean she is at this point just staring him she said that she didn't even know how to feel uh whether to hate him to love him to to kick him she wanted i mean so many things emotionally were going through her mind but here's what he said he said I was a guard there, and I'm ashamed to admit it, but it's true. But since then, I've come to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It has been hard for me to forgive myself for all the cruel things I did, but I know that God has forgiven me. And please, if you would, I would like to hear it from your lips, too, that God has forgiven me. Now, here's what she said in her book. She said, I stood there. I whose sins had again and again been forgiven, and I could not forgive. It could not have been many seconds that he stood there. He had his hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I would ever had to do. For I had to do it, and I knew that. It was as simple as uh, it was as simple and as horrible as that. And I stood there with a coldness clutching my heart and so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down to my arm and, I, and sprang into my joined hands. And then this healing, with this healing warmth, it seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. She cried out, I forgive you, brother with all of my heart. And it says, for a long time they grasped hands and the former guard and the former prisoner held each other in that moment. God, he doesn't treat us according to our sins. If God doesn't, if God doesn't give you what you deserve, be very grateful. God, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that he doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us grace. He gives us mercy, and he has a short memory. In Matthew 11, verses 24 through 26, it says this, Therefore I say to you, all things for which I pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive you your transgressions. So what can we learn from this? What can we take away from this as dads, um, moms? 
In Romans 8, 32, it says this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. We're, looking a, we're, we're talking about a father who sacrificed his own son on our behalf that we can have life. That is what God says. I, I, I've put this love inside of you through the sacrifice that I've made, through the Holy Spirit. When you receive me, you receive the Holy Spirit. This is the kind of forgiveness, the love that I want in my families. This is the kind of love and forgiveness um, I need in my church. This is the kind of love and forgiveness that, that says to the lost world, this dark and dying world, that you are my children. Max Lucado has a book, uh, and the title is, is Just Like Jesus. And in the small print there below the title, it says, God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. So as we serve God, are we patient like God is patient? Do we keep records of wrongs? God does not. Are we full of grace and mercy as God has been gracious and merciful to us? And are we forgiving as God has been forgiving toward us? As we live out this day as, as dads and moms and toward our families, I pray that, that dads, we would take the lead in this and take this scripture. No, we're not perfect. We are not perfect. But guys, we can live out God's word. We can, we can try to just, just submit to him daily uh, and, and daily confessing our sins and, and repenting and, and moving toward him. God is making us like Christ every day. And so dads, may we receive this love that God offers to us and may we pour it back in to our families. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time. And I pray that as we uh, go about our day to day on this Father's Day, that we would uh, be like you, that we would uh, love our families with that unconditional love, and that we would uh, just seek you with all of our heart as dads. Um, during this invitation, Lord, I pray that we would uh, confess those sins that, that we've been holding inside, that we know that we're guilty of. May we confess these and make them right with our families. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name.